To introduce our speaker, please welcome Emily Riley. Thank you, Michelle. I first met tonight's speaker when I was an intern for Claire Booth Lewis Policy Institute in 2012. She spoke at one of our intern events, and I was so captivated by her revelations on Islam that I wanted her to come to my campus and share what she had to say with all of my friends. That fall, I was a senior, and I brought Nani as kind of my parting gift to Furman University. And to say that it was a packed house doesn't really do it justice. We had a small classroom and it was standing room only, mostly filled with protesters and Muslim students. So it was a lot of fun. Unwaveringly, Ms. Darwish travels the country sharing the true dangers of Islam to colleges and groups just like mine and yours. And it's no small wonder that she's so passionate about these issues. Her own father was taken all too soon by the all-consuming hatred of Islam. Ms. Darwish was born in Cairo, Egypt, and raised in the Muslim faith. Her father headed the Egyptian military intelligence in Gaza and the Sinai in the 1950s, and he spearheaded the Fedayeen operations against Israel under Egyptian President Gamal Adel Nasser. He was assassinated on the Gaza Strip by Israeli forces in 1956 when Nani was only eight years old. In Nani's biography, she recalls how she was taught hatred, jihad, violence, vengeance, and retaliation growing up. She shares firsthand insights on the oppression of women in Muslim societies, and she recounts her journey to actually renounce jihad. Mrs. Darwish is the author of three books, The Devil We Don't Know, The Dark Side of Jihad, Now They Call Me Infidel, Why I Renounced Jihad for America, Israel, and the War on Terror, and Cruel and Usual Punishment, The Terrifying Global Implications of Islamic Law. Her background is in journalism with a degree in sociology and anthropology from American University in Cairo, and today, Ms. Darwish resides in the United States, has converted to Christianity, and is married and has three children. And in 2004, she founded Arabs for Israel. Please give a warm welcome to our speaker and my all-time favorite leading loose lady, Ms. Nani Darwish. Thank you, Emily. I'm just honored to be here. Uh, Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute is one of my favorite organizations to speak to, and especially that I meet the most inspirational young women who are just amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Just uh, to add a little bit about my, myself, uh, I was born, like Emily said, as a, a Muslim in Cairo, Egypt, and in the Gaza Strip. And uh, my father headed the Egyptian military intelligence in Gaza, and he was killed in the jihad against Israel. <clears throat> so I really lived uh, for 30 years of my life in the Middle East in the heart of the Arab-Israeli conflict. I attended Gaza elementary schools. I, uh, you know, it's the same thing that you see today was back then. Teaching hatred, teaching anti-Semitism. Um, all, all men are not created equal over, uh, under the Constitution. Islamic constitutions have different laws for different people. Men and women. It's a totally different life and um, uh, so I lived, I, I, you know, I lived for 30 years, and I witnessed honor killing of girls, girls who are raped, and they're accused of having extra sex, uh, you know, uh, sex outside of marriage, and uh, they are killed. 
and this is this is something that's allowed under Islamic law, under the law, to uh, uh, to kill some uh, to kill somebody, a, a girl, who has had sex before marriage. They don't ask why. So, <clears throat> so I I uh, moved to America in 1978, and I am just blessed to be here. And uh, I'm very grateful to this country because I started speaking after 9/11. And I started speaking without really planning it. Yeah, I, it just came automatically. I wanted to tell Americans what is the problem. After 9-11, I heard a lot of people in America saying, what did we do? Because the Western mind always, uh, you know, logically, when somebody comes to stab you in America, say, why? But you're seeing stabbings today in the Middle East of Jews, regardless who they are. They, uh, you see sheikhs in mosques from the pulpit of the mosque. Islamic leaders are sitting, standing, preaching their religion, and then they get out a sword or a knife, and they go, they go say, go stab Jews, stab them, stab them, stab them. This is in the holy uh, place called mosque. You, you cannot, as, as Americans, you can't even imagine a pastor in a church doing that. And that shows you the, the difference in the values. It's a horrendous difference. It's almost opposite value system. And that's why I started speak, speaking. And it's now my mission to warn America from, from the threat of not just only Islamic terrorism, but also the threat to our freedom, our way of life, human rights, women's rights, the culture, the trust that we have between each other in Western culture. That's, that's something I really noticed when I moved to America, that people kind of like, there is trust between people. In the Middle East, everybody can report on anybody. There's distrust within even the family, between neighbors. You have to watch what you say. And the reason is, it's all, in my opinion, it all goes back to Islamic law. Islamic law is not just something enforced by the government. Like in Saudi Arabia, for instance, they do behead people in the public square. If they commit uh, a crime of sin, like extramarital affairs, uh, if you don't believe in Islam anymore, these are crimes for which a person can be killed, and they are killed by the government of Saudi Arabia or the government of Iran. They hang people. Or being gay, they hang people for that. But some of the countries that appear to the West as moderate, they have these laws on the books, but the way they enforce them is, is different. They play a trick on the United Nations so they don't uh, uh, categorize them as uh, as oppressive governments. For for instance, Egypt, which is supposed to be more moderate or modern, <coughs> uh, a person who commits, let's say, a, um, a sex outside of marriage, what happens is the parents or the brother can kill the girl, but at the same time the the government does not arrest them. They will say, we don't know who killed her. So this is the difference between Saudi Arabia and moderate Muslim countries. That's how they get away with it. But the punishment is still enforced. It's, def it's just by different, by different means. In fact, it's better to be 
arrested by the government and punished than, be, than experience vigilante street justice because often they really torture them on the street. For instance, the, the Coptic Christians in Egypt, many of them get killed and the police say, we don't know who killed them. Guess why? The police doesn't want to arrest them. There's a law in Sharia that clearly states that a Muslim, if a Muslim kills another Muslim, he will get the death penalty, he will be prosecuted. But if a Muslim kills a non-Muslim, he will not get prosecuted, he will not get the death penalty. This is a clear law. Can you believe in America, if you have a law like that, that says, a Christian in America, if they kill another Christian, they'll be prosecuted. But if they kill a Jew or a Muslim, we, they will not be prosecuted. It's unimaginable to have a law like that in America. But in all Muslim countries, this is a law. But how do moderate Muslim countries get away with this law? They don't say we're not going to arrest them because they don't want to look bad. So what they do is just, we can't find the people who killed this Christian man. We can't find them. All, uh, a large number of Christians have been killed in the last few decades since radical Islam took over. You know how many people in Egypt are in jail for killing Christians who are being killed all the time? Zero. And it's because of that law. It's a religious law that everybody respects, even the police. So they say, we don't know. So given this nature of Islam that is totally against our value system, it's against our freedom, against women's rights, against everything we believe in, Given this nature of Islam, and especially after 9-11, it should be logical, really, to assume that the West would be united in regards to how to protect its citizens from this chaotic culture, from this um, uh, tyranny. It's a, uh, look, look at the Middle East. Uh, people are escaping to Europe from all the Middle East. It's not just from Syria and Iraq. They are from Afghanistan, they are from Egypt, they are from everywhere. They're just crossing the Mediterranean into Europe. Who are these people? We don't know. Some of them could be ISIS sympathizers. What is the West try doing to protect itself? Does it have any strategy? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like they have a strategy. America asked after 9-11, a lot of people in the media asked, where are the people who should speak against radical Islam and jihad and 9-11? Well, I spoke right away. And so many books were written. So many uh, articles were written and still half of America does, doesn't want to touch the topic of Islam. And they even call, some of them call me Islamophobe and racist because I speak against an ideology. I'm not speaking about people. There are, some Muslims are the, you know, some of the nicest people I know. If you go to Egypt, you see my family, they're very kind. They probably take you, to tourist areas and have, make dinner for you, and they're very friendly. So when I speak, I'm not speaking about people because there's good and bad about, uh, with everybody, but I'm speaking about the ideology, which is the tent under which people in the Middle East are, are living under. And that is what I'm speaking about. But in order to silence me in America now, they always try to claim that I'm speaking against Muslim people, which is not true, because Muslim people are just good and bad in everybody. 
So this is a, to a totalitarian ideology that is not just a religion. According to Islamic leaders themselves, just, just read what they say. Take the words from their mouth, not from mine. Uh, the, the number one Islamic thinker of the 20th century, he, his name was Abdel uh, Maududi, Maududi, Sheikh Maududi. He stated that Islam is not just a religion, but it's a totalitarian system like, and he compared it with communism and socialism. He compared it to that. This is Sheikh Maududi. He is the, the father of the 20th century of Islam. And he compared Islam with a totalitarian system. And he stressed that you don't have freedom under this system, neither in your public nor private lives. So let's take the, uh, their word for it, not mine. So. President of Turkey stated that moderate and radical Islam don't exist. It's only Islam. Why? He's, he's blaming the West. Why are you in the West calling moderate and radical Islam? We only have Islam. But do we care about what they tell us? No. The Islamic threat did not start today with ISIS. It didn't start with Al-Qaeda. It didn't start with 9-11 or with the stabbings that are happening today all over Israel. Stabbing in London of a policeman by a Muslim, a policeman standing, a British policeman stabbed and beheaded because he's an infidel. What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for people starting to stab Americans on the streets of America. It's coming if we don't do something. We have to have a, strat a strategy. So it didn't also, the threat of Islam didn't start with the 1972 Olympic uh, um, uh, massacre in Germany. That's not when it started. It didn't start in the 1700s with the Barbary pirate attacks on European and American merchant ships and by four North African Muslim country, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. Libya was causing us trouble in the 1700s. So America historically should, should know better. We seem to have forgotten that in March 1785, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams went to London to negotiate with the Libyan ambassador. He was the envoy of Libya. And they, they asked him, what gives you the right to attack our ships in um, our ships in the Mediterranean. And this is what he said. Concerning the group of the um, pretentious to make war upon nations who had done them no, uh, oh, that's what, I'm sorry, that's what was uh, Jefferson said. We have done you no injury. Why are you doing this to our ships? And the Libyan ambassador said that the Quran, it's written in the Quran, that all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet of Islam, and they are non-Muslims, these nations are all sinners. And whom uh, it was right the, it's the right and the duty of Muslims to the faithful believers of the Prophet Muhammad to blunder and enslave them. And what every Muslim man who had slain in this warfare was sure to go to heaven. 
America knew in the 1700s what the purpose of Islam was. Thomas Jefferson then got the Quran and he actually couldn't believe it and he read it for himself. And that same Quran is here in Washington. And people think that he got the Quran because some Muslims here say, even Thomas Jefferson had the Quran, thinking it's something that he did because of admiration. He, did, he got it to understand why these people are attacking our ships. So the Islamic threat also did not start with the Ottoman Empire when it attacked Eastern Europe. Do you know what the Ottomans, the Turks used to do when they attacked Eastern Europe? They used to kidnap boys, young boys from families, and recruit them in an army to fight for Islam and converted them to Islam by force. Some Eastern European parents, in order for them not to give up their sons, they used to uh, lose an eye, uh, you know, handicap them on purpose so they don't take them. They, they love their kids so much that they would rather see them not taken away to some remote Islamic country to be a warrior for Islam. So they, they took one eye, they broke a leg or something. So the Islamic threat to Europe did not start now. It was during all the way to the gates of Vienna. It goes back much earlier than that. When Muslim Arabs burst out of Arabia in the seventh century after Muhammad died, they burst out and conquered great civilizations of the region. They conquered Egypt, which was a Christian nation. A lot of people don't know that. Egypt was 100% Christian, Coptic Christian. Persia was not Arab and was not even uh, Muslim at all. They conquered these two great civilizations and forced Arabic as the language of Egypt. Egypt's language was not Arabic. It was old Egyptian um, language with, you know, with some Coptic Christian language. And they forbade Egyptians from speaking their own language, burned the Alexandria Library, which had all the knowledge of the world at that time, and Egypt never saw its glory days again. And now Egypt is one of the radical, most radical anti-Semitic Islamic countries that produced the Muslim Brotherhood. Iran was conquered in the same year Egypt was conquered. And now Iran is holding the banner of Islam, an Islamic state that tortures people. Egypt used to have women, women queens that ruled and people respected them and they ruled with power. And after Islam conquered Egypt, not one woman became a leader in Egypt because it's forbidden under Islam. Many queens were, Hatshepsut was very, it's not as famous as uh, Cleopatra and Nefertiti, but she built the fleets of Egypt. And she sent them to get her eye makeup from India. <laughs> this great Egyptian civilization was destroyed by the Arab conquerors. It can happen to superpowers. That's why I'm speaking. The Arabs also went to the area of Jerusalem, which is the holy land of the, of the uh, Jews and the Christians. It was their holy land. Islam made a name for itself in Jerusalem, even though the word Jerusalem was never mentioned in the Quran. And what did Islam do? Muhammad asked the follow his followers to go kill the Jews wherever you find them and eliminate their history. Eliminate their history. And what did they do? They went on the temple 
the ruins of the temple, the Solomon Temple, and what did they do to eliminate the history of the Jews? They built a mosque. And that's why we have an Arab-Israeli conflict now. Because by biblical lands have been taken over by Islam, and they call it a holy mosque. That's our holy mosque. They forgot that they built it on, on purpose. Uh, on, on, uh, so with all this history, and with all this Islamic terror against the West and Israel, it has been consistent and persistent for, for centuries. And the only periods of, of peace happened only when Islam weakened. I'll give you a quote why they never appreciate peace, because there's a quotation in the Quran. The only time the the Quran mentioned the word peace was as follows. This is Quran, Surah 47, verse 35. It says, it says the following. So do not weaken and call for peace while you are superior. So call for peace only when you are weak. This is happened throughout history. When Islam is weak, they, they, they make peace when, and they live in peace with the Jews or the Christians. Or when they are strong, then the Islamic movement rises again. And about 60, 70 years ago, when oil money started uh, empowering Arabia, which was a very weak country, country, it empowered it so much. All of the Arabian Peninsula was so empowered that radical Islam, the real Islam, was, came out. They are no longer weak. And that's why we have a problem now. And what happened in 73 when they had a boycott against us, against the West? They didn't want to sell oil in 73. Did we learn our lesson and drilled in America to stop this insanity against us, to use oil as a weapon? No, what, what we did was give them more money and buy more oil and enrich them more. So this is the strategy of the West. Why? Because they don't want to drill in America because, oh my God, the birds and the bees and the owls and the fish which is not true. It's not, it, you can drill and the environment, can, you can do both. And, and the environment can still be good, or fine. I mean, look at, look at the Arabian Peninsula. There is drilling everywhere. And the lifespan of the average Saudi and the average Kuwaiti is much higher than before drilling for oil. The camels are alive, the fishies in the Red Sea are fine, and the Arabian Sea is fine. They have a lot of beautiful resorts for tourists. The only reason that they pollute the Arab uh, water lines is not because of oil drilling, it's because of war. So this idea that they don't want to drill in America because of the environment is a lie. They don't want to drill because they don't want America to continue progressing. They want to put a limit on our progress. And that's why we're not drilling. They can do both. They can take care of the environment. And uh, so all these Arab countries are fine with drilling. So. Islamic terror and tyranny should not be news to the West. To those who have forgotten 9-11, it came as a reminder, thousands of books were written, thousands of articles were written. Why is the West still undetermined as to how to face the Islamic threat? Uh, 
There is no strategy. Not even in Europe. Not in America. Being honest about the threat to citizens for any country is the most important part of the job of the government. And the US government is not telling us this horrific threat. The media is not telling us. And we have to learn it on our own. So Europe and America seem to have forgotten their bloody and painful history with Islam. And they, are, they seem to be called caught unprepared. The West's reaction to Islam today appears to have no memory of its history, of the painful history. So is the strategy of the West now to just do nothing? Which is fine. If I do nothing against somebody coming to attack me, Fine, declare this is our strategy so citizens of America are not sitting scratching their head what's going on. But I think it's more than just doing nothing. We are doing nothing to protect ourselves. And I'm not saying go fight a war in the Middle East to kill ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Put that all aside. Don't go to war. Fine, but protect your, yourself within your own sovereign nation. Why are our borders open, allowing infiltration by ISIS? And they are. It's a well-known fact in the Middle East. If you want to go to America and go to Mexico, pay some Mexicans some money, and you'll, you'll go into America. It's a poor country. Mexico is a poor country. Just go there, go to Mexico, go to any Central American country, and uh, we look a little dark like Mexicans, so we'll just c come in. It's known. You know where I heard that? On Arab TV, on Al Jazeera. There was a university professor speaking on Al Jazeera, uh, and he stated, Go to Mexico, take, take a little bag of anthrax with you, and sprinkle it in Washington, D.C. That was on Arab national TV. But did you hear about that in CNN or Fox or any? No. They're telling us what their plan is. So our strategy is to be silent, but the crime is that we're not protecting ourselves and our citizens. Fine, be silent, don't go to war. I can understand. But to allow all these uh, people who are escaping Syria and uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, without, we will never know who's the bad guy and who's the good guy. They don't know. The governments over there don't even know who's the good guy and who's the bad guy, let alone us. So what happens to a country that gets terrorized by Islam? We know what Egypt did after it got terrorized by Islam. It capitulated, became a Muslim country. Same thing with Iran. It used to be called Persia. And. We cannot underestimate the power of terrorism on the human psyche. Not only the human psyche, but the psyche of nations. A nation that has been terrorized can capitulate. It's like the Stockholm Syndrome. Nations can act this way too, not just individuals. Under enough pressure, under enough stress, nations go into modes of denial. Who did America vote for after 9-11, the first president after 9-11? His name rhymes with Osama. 
Is this unconscious? Our Secretary of State, uh, she, after the Benghazi attack, called the, the Prime Minister of Egypt and told him this is an Al-Qaeda attack but lied to her own citizens and did not want to tell them and insisted this was a video. Who brought the idea of the video? Never heard it in Egyptian media. I never heard it except after America said it. I monitor Arab media. When um, before, just a, the, a few hours before the attack on the Libyan embassy, there was an attack on the Egyptian uh, American embassy in Cairo. And the people who were, you know, rioting, they were not talking anything about video, nothing. They were holding Al-Qaeda flags, the black flags of Al-Qaeda, one on top of the roof of some building in the, in the embassy and the fence. And put the flag of Al-Qaeda on the American embassy in Cairo. That was just a few hours before the attack on the, on the, um, on the ambassador the American, in, in Libya. Nobody in Cairo. But guess what? Just a couple of hours bef before or after the attack in Cairo by Al-Qaeda sympathizers, the U.S. embassy in Cairo issued an apology on, a face, uh, on the internet for the video. Who authorized this apology? And then they withdrew it right away. It was an apology for the video, even though nobody in Egypt was talking about it. That's, just not, that's not just Libya. There was a, an official apology by the US embassy in Cairo about the video, trying to give the impression that all of this was just from the video. So we have leaders who don't want to tell us the truth, who don't want to. Uh, everybody is, is walking in America just doesn't understand what's going on. They think they are stupid. Or maybe I'm just exaggerating my fear about Islam and, and, and Sharia, this is all exaggeration. I might be crazy because my media is not panicking. My government is not panicking. There is no strategy. And they're welcoming all these immigrants from, from ISIS land, from Syria. And so there must be no problem. So. So is, is, this, is this a strategy, not to have a strategy and just welcome it? So it is, it's really becoming um, embarrassing. I see a lot of, I, I communicate a lot on the internet with people in, in the Middle East. And they tell me, what's wrong with America? Are they crazy? Why are they allowing all these ISIS sympathizers to, to come in. I'm, I'm telling you what's, what's, what people are telling me. So America doesn't even know the opinions of, of, of the normal people in the Middle East. They look at America and they say, why are they doing this to themselves? There is no strategy. And I want to ask you, what does Islam do to a nation? What, what does it do to a nation? Why do you see all these revolutions in the Middle East? Is it because they love revolutions? No. It's because Islam provides a legal system and a, a system of government that is so brutal and so uh, uh, incompatible with human uh, human nature, that every now and then they have to revolt and have a revolution. Even moderate Muslim countries like Egypt. Egypt had a 1919 revolution. 
1952 revolution. And in between all of that, assassinations, of course, of leaders. 2011 revolutions, 2013 counter-revolution. And they still, with Sisi, they still want to assassinate him. This is what Islam affects our, the political system of every country. And Ben Carson was right when he said, I don't want to see a Muslim leader in, in America. He was right. Why? Because if you have a Muslim leader, according to Islamic law, any Muslim leader must rule by Sharia, whether he likes it or not. Otherwise, we have to assassinate him. Why do you think Anwar Sadat was assassinated? Because when he signed the peace treaty with Israel, he violated Islamic law. That's why he was killed. Nobody talks about that. So why do we want to invite a Muslim person, he calls himself Muslim, obviously he should be abiding by Islam. If you call yourself a Muslim, you have to abide by Sharia. So why should we put ourselves in a situation where we elect a Muslim leader who will be under a death penalty, a death threat by Muslims if he does not rule by Islam, by Islamic law. It's clear, the job of the Muslim head of state is clearly stated in Sharia. He must rule by Sharia. He must um, have jihad as his number one duty. What's jihad, according to Islam, is to war with non-Muslims to establish the religion of Islam. Under Islamic law, no country is sovereign if it's not Muslim. No country should, no country's safety should be respected if it's not Muslim. Actually, it's the job of a Muslim head of state, especially in time of, uh, of uh, power, to actually attack non-Muslim countries. They have lots of oils. Lo and behold, they do 9-11. They became powerful with oil money. It's so obvious. And the threat is not just from terror. It's the terror and beheading that you see. That's just one aspect of it. It's, it's the laws that punish people for blasphemy, for speaking. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, our Bill of Rights is all threatened by Islamic law. And I'm very, I'm very concerned. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm speaking. I'm putting, actually, ac according to my culture of origin, I cannot visit any Islamic countries. You know why? Because under Islamic law, I left Islam and I must be killed. And not only I must be killed by a government, but anybody on the street can kill me and will never be prosecuted. That, that's what Islamic law states. And so this is, this is what we are dealing with. This is very serious. Islam, radical Islam, was really empowered, especially after the 70s, with oil money. When I came to America, I never wore the head cover in Egypt. Nobody wore head cover in Egypt. In the late 70s, I moved to America, 78, 79, and I went to visit a mosque because I thought, it's nice to visit a mosque in America. It's probably very modern. And they told me, how come you're not wearing Islamic clothes? I said, I never wore it anywhere in my life. Neither did my mother, neither, neither did my grandmother. And they said, but in America, we want to show our presence. And we have to wear Islamic clothes. When I came to America, I visited um, UCLA, and I had a friend of mine who was in LA. And she was a Muslim. She had a, a bunch of friends, Muslim from Egypt. She had a bunch of friends from 
Egypt also, and none of them were, was wearing the head cover. Lo and behold, 20 years later, I go to visit, to speak at UCLA, and there is a whole group of Muslims wearing head cover. This is the radicalization because of the empowerment with Arab oil. It's now a fashion statement to wear the head cover. And I know a woman who wore it, and I asked her, she was, she was never wearing it before. I thought, what happened? You, you totally changed, and she said, in America, the ethnic look gives you power. That's what she said. It's empowering. So, Jews and Christians are, are allowed, actually, they, they are, their blood is kosher for Muslims under Islamic law. The preachers are t saying this every day in, 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 uh, in the mosques, and nobody wants to talk about it. But if one word is said that is not totally proper by a preacher in America or politician, they go all over him. Hey, yeah, racist, bigot, you know, they know how to fight, but they can only fight people who are not as aggressive as Muslims. They fight Christians, they ruin reputation of our politicians, especially people who are religious or are conservative, but with, with Muslims, I don't hear them say anything. Look at, look at the laws against women in, in Islam. In a court of law, a woman, the value of her testimony is half the value of a man. This is clear. Guess how many women go and file lawsuits against men? in the Muslim world. Zero, because they lose. Is that the kind of law that we have to respect? And the leftists who claim to be pro-women are silent. And that's what amazes me. They, it, they, it's just totally, they don't want to touch it. Uh, so, the West does not have a strategy or has a strategy that they don't want to talk about, which is capitulation. And uh, I believe that without a good strategy, uh, this is political suicide, this is social cultural suicide, and it's gross negligence. It's gross negligence not to protect your culture, your country, your way of life, your constitution. Western politicians and the media are keeping their citizens on purpose, misinformed and uninformed. We must be active and demand the truth. We must equip ourselves with the truth and take them at their, as the, at their word. Go Go to, uh, on the internet, uh, they translate all the, uh, what poli Arab politicians say, Islamic leaders say. Uh, it's called memorytv.com, just memory, M-E-M-R-I-T-V.com. And just watch it. You don't even have to see a commentary on it. Just watch what they say. And, uh, none of it is being shown on Western TV. So we must equip ourselves with the truth by, by really researching it and knowing it. And then we also uh, must be active. We must be active by uh, sending, uh, uh, you know, supporting uh, conservative ideas speaking the truth and not, never be offended from being called Islamophobe. As long as you're not insulting a, a person, a human being, you're criticizing an ideology, you are on the right side. 
never be intimidated by people that, oh, you're, um, you, you hate Muslims because you speak against Islam. You say, I don't hate Muslims, I love Muslims. I just criticize Islam, it's my right to criticize an ideology, not the people. And that's what I do. But to shut me up, they, they accuse me of all these, all this nonsense. Um, so right now, for instance, there is a bill in Congress that says that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood should be designated as a terrorist organization. And of course, the liberals and the Democrats don't want to assign the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. Egypt assigned the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, and America did not. It's illegal to, to, to be a Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt now because it's a, it's a terrorist organization. And in America, they're all over campuses. They're operating under uh, other names. And this bill has to, uh, hopefully we can pass it. it has, uh, hopefully it will pass. Uh, because when Egypt looks at America resisting calling Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization while it's assassinating people in Egypt, it leaves America looking bad. Like, we are not standing up against terrorism. And just to conclude, I, I just hope that for once America unites a little bit it's against this obvious threat. It's obvious threat not just to conservatives and Republicans and Christians. It's a threat to uh, the ideology of liberal, liberalism itself. And that's why I don't understand. I don't understand why the people who are pro-homosexual, um, they, they are tolerant of a religion that, that want to kill homosexuals. Why are they uh, tolerant of a religion that oppresses women horribly? Female genital mutilation happens in, in Egypt at a large scale, especially to the uneducated classes. Um, why, why is the left uh, denying the, the problem? And we are on the side of the truth, we are on the side of, of reality, and we should never underestimate the power of reality and the truth. And I'm praying for America that we will at least unite before this gets out of hand because it can happen. It can happen, it happened to, to Egypt, it happened to Persia in history, it can happen to superpowers. Thank you very much.